Bless you. Good morning to the church. Good morning. This morning I greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I also greet those who are joining with us on social media. And I pray as you join with us that you be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading is taken this morning from Psalm 95 from 1 to the end. O oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is great and great, sorry, for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if we will hear his voice, and harden not your heart, has a vocation, has in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. When our fathers tempted me, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work, Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do that know their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my word that they should not enter my rest. I will now ask the world to join with me and sing that song, bow down and worship him.
So let us bow down and worship him. Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise, Father. We thank you for this day. For your mercy, this is the day that the Lord has made. And let us do what? Rejoice in it. So, Father, this morning we are thanking you, Lord, for all that you have done for us, Lord. We are thanking you, Lord, for being there for us, Lord. You said in your word, Lord, cast all our cares onto you because you care for us, Lord, in Jesus' name. This morning, Lord, you know Lord, what we are facing this morning. You know the situation, Lord, that we are facing this morning, Lord. But, Lord, we are trusting you. We are believing in your word that with God all things are possible. And, Father, you say all things are possible, Lord, with you, Lord. And nothing, Lord, surprises you, Lord. You know, Lord, you're the beginning and you're the ending, Lord. You know everything even before it happens, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. So, Father, this morning we are saying as a church, Lord, that we are trusting and believing in your word. We are trusting and believing in your favor, Lord, that you have for us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for covering us and keeping us safe, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for covering us, Lord, over this pandemic, Lord. Lord, we know that we thought that we have been clear, but come on, Lord. We know that, God, that with you all things are possible, Lord. And we know that even though it isn't being raised up again, Lord, we are believing in you and trusting you, Lord, that you, God, have already conquered it, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. So, Father, I want to encourage your people, Lord, your saints, Lord, to bow down and worship you, to bow down and trust in you and believe in your word, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. You said in your word, no level form shall prosper. You said no level form shall prosper, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. You said in your word, when God is for us, what or who can be against us? And Father, we come against every situation, Lord, that the enemy may burn before us right now. And we claim it right now. And we claim victory over it right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we say that no level form shall prosper against your children. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we declare, Lord, victory over COVID-19 in the name of Jesus Christ. We declare that we are victorious over COVID-19 in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray those, Lord, who are affected, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will touch them one more time in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that they will get on their knees and bow down and praise you and thank you, Lord, for healing them in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that they will give you their life. They will give their life to you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we declare, Lord, that we are victorious people. We are overcomers by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we have overcome COVID-19 by the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, the blood that cleanses water than snow, Lord. Your blood that cleanses, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we know that we cannot do it by ourselves. But your word declared, not by might, not by power but through your spirit. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, not only move in this church, it will move in the community, it will move in your word, Lord, and your, pe your people will receive your Holy Spirit, and they will come to know you as Lord and Savior in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, they will come to know you, Lord, as their creator, as their mediator in the name of Jesus Christ. They will come to know you, Lord, as their healer in the name of Jesus Christ. Help them declare, Lord, that they, are, that they need you and we need you, Lord, even more than now, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. This morning, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you will cover us as a church also. You will cover our pastors and our leaders, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over our church and over our lives and over our world, over our country, in Jesus' name, over our prime ministers, over our positions, Lord. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ and those who, Lord, who want to be working, Lord, in, in, in the front line, I pray, Lord, that you will protect them. You will cover them under your blood in the name of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, at the end of the day, that your people can say, it is the blood of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, that they can say, Lord, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. So, Lord, that we may live and we may be free from our sins in Jesus' name. Father, take all honor, all glory, and all power because it belongs to you. And as we humble ourselves to you, we give you thanks and we give you praise as we bow down and worship you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Amen.
Jesus, our Lord and Savior, those who are here in our assembly at Chalky Mount, St. Andrew Barbados, uh, those across the region and indeed across the world, let me take this opportunity on behalf of our own General Board of Administration of the Wesleyan Holiness Church and indeed the International Board of the Wesleyan Church, which um, uh, covers some 100 countries around the world, extend to you a blessed new year. Today I want to share with you on what I'm, what I'm calling Paul's challenge to the true followers of Christ. Paul's challenge to the true followers of Christ. And I draw your attention to Ephesians chapter 4 and I'll just read a few verses initially. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let us pray. And may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Paul's challenge to the true followers of Christ. It is believed that the book of Ephesians was written around A.D. 62 or so during Paul's imprisonment in Rome. It is also believed that it was written in part to inspire unity among the brethren since there was the tendency for the Jewish side of the brethren that is to separate themselves from the Gentiles in the context of the church there at Ephesus. But more profoundly, Paul also used the occasion to give some practical advice on how to live a holy, pure, and Christ-inspired lifestyle as followers of Jesus. And brothers and sisters, it is up to some aspects of this advice and admonition that we wish to give attention today in the context of this sermon and as mirrored in the text under consideration, Ephesians chapter 4. Permit me to jump ahead of myself and to say to you that, and I speak most profoundly to say to you that the best decision anyone can make in life is to give themselves to Jesus. Indeed, as I have found and as those of us who are part of the household have found that there is no regret in serving Jesus. In fact, most people will say to you that the only regret that they would have had is that they did not start to serve him before the, the time that they did. And so I wish to personally echo the sentiments of the psalmist in Psalm 122 and verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. I suggest to you that is in the house of the Lord that we meet for prayer, that we meet for worship, that we meet for fellowship. It is in the house of the Lord that we receive God's word in the community of God's people in a special and powerful way. I say to you, brothers and sisters, that it is in this environment, in the house of God, and buttressed by our own commitment to the personal and private
deliberate practice of spiritual disciplines that we develop in our own Christian character and relatedly manifest those virtues and bear witness to the kind of testimony that is so vital as we live in a spiritually darkened and troubled world. And so today, brothers and sisters, as the Holy Spirit leads, I endeavor to share with you some of those challenges which Paul gave to the Ephesians and which are also relevant for us today in the community of faith as we walk the Christian race, as we travel the Christian journey. Firstly, there is the challenge to walk worthily. There is a challenge to walk worthily. Note the words of Paul in verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Oh, hallelujah. So we are to walk worthy of our calling and vocation. And vocation, brothers and sisters, connotes the idea of one's employment or main occupation, but more succinctly and more germane in this context. It suggests something regarded as particularly worthy and requiring great dedication. And so I suggest to you that calling relatedly speaks to a strong urge toward a particular way of life. How many of you today, brothers and sisters, understand that the Christian endeavor, the Christian walk, is a calling? It is a calling. Peter, in his epistle in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, reminds us, and I quote, that we are a chosen people, hallelujah, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that we may declare the praise of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Hallelujah. Thank God this morning for the change. Hallelujah. And you can emphasize change. Thank God for the change that has been wrought in us through the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit. Thank God for saving us, saving our souls, for delivering us from the self-life which was opposed to the things of God. That self-life that led us down a path of hopelessness and distress and despair. Thank God today for freedom from the shackles of Satan and the shackles of sin. Once already said, once I was bound by sin's golden fetters. Chained like a slave, I struggled in vain. But I received a glorious freedom when Jesus broke my fetters in twain. And the song before it said, glorious freedom, wonderful freedom no more. In chains of sin I repine, Jesus. The glorious emancipator, now and forever he shall be mine. Note, my dear brothers and sisters, how John describes this newfound relationship in John 8 38. And I quote the New International Version So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. But note what the new living translation, how, how that virgin puts it so beautifully. So if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, my friends, we must walk worthily. Walk worthy of our calling. That's what Paul suggested to the Ephesians. But secondly, he seemed to suggest to them that they are to 
war consistent with their character and vision. Not only were they to walk worthy of their calling and vocation, but secondly, they were to walk consistent with their character and vision. Character, brothers and sisters, has to do with those distinguishing qualities that make a person different from others. And a note, note the words of Paul specifically in verse 2 and verse 3 of the text. And again, I make a reference to the New International Version. Note what he said. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. End of quote. Beautiful language. But a beautiful reality to which he points us. And I want to suggest to us today that these virtues highlighted in these verses are in essence graces of the Holy Spirit. Paul in Galatians chapter 5 compares the life in Christ and the life outside of Christ. Or otherwise put, he compares the workings of life in the Spirit with life in the flesh or with acts of the flesh. And again, I want the word to speak for itself. Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 and following. Because it would seem to me that he reiterates, he reiterates, he Paul that is, reiterates the idea of freedom in Christ you, my brothers and sisters, he said, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather serve one another humbly in love. Verse 14. For the eternal law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Note verse 15. If you hate and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. But verse 19 to 23 are quite pungent and important. Notice what he said. And this is Galatians 5. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Hallelujah. That Spirit, brothers and sisters, who causes us to understand clearly the uniqueness of the body of which we are a part. That Holy Spirit who unites us in a common bond and in a common hope. That Spirit, He who empowers us and energizes us to work for the common good of humanity, for the common good of society, and for the common good of the world. And I say to you today that we are at a very crucial juncture. 
culture and the history of the world. Even as I speak, there are many who are plagued by fear and uncertainty. For many, the outlook is bleak. But that same spirit, hallelujah, our God has not given to us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And he continues to energize us and to equip us and to empower us for the challenging task of kingdom building. And so the onus is still on us to go into Jerusalem and Judea. To go into Samaria. And to make descendants and to make disciples rather of all nations. Yes, walk worthy of your calling and vocation. Walk worthy consistent with your character and vision. But Paul seemed to suggest to us that we should walk worthy despite the challenges and vulnerabilities that confront us. Vulnerability speaks to the idea of being easily hurt or attacked. It is the state of being open to injury or even appearing as though you are. But let me say to you today that for us in the household of faith, in God, there is perfect protection and perfect hope. If I, if I may describe it that way. Hallelujah. For us in the household of faith, vulnerability is not a sign of weakness. And even as I speak, I very well understand, and you know it too, that we will constantly be the object of attack by the enemy of our souls. And this is what Don Stewart said in an article I came across in that article he talked about how we how do we deal with Satan's attack or rather Satan attack Satan's attack on the believers and he said and I quote though the devil may attack at any time he will always do it when we think or when he thinks it is to his advantage. Oftentimes he will attack us from an unexpected source. Someone whom we least expected. To put that in my own words. But he goes on to say, though we may win a temporary victory over him in that spiritual battle we face Satan will return to fight another time Christians therefore must always be on their guard in the court and you know very well brothers and sisters from personal experience and based on scripture that in his schemes he comes like a roaring liar, liar at times, a roaring lion. Yes, he's a liar too. The scripture refers to him as your father lies. At other times he comes like an angel of light. But his impact is equally deadly. And so the rallying cry for us at the beginning of this year. That rallying cry that I gave you today has to be one of confidence and values. Confidence and values. We certainly, as the army of God, will not retreat. We will not surrender. We, as part of the army of God, will not run from the enemy. And so in this regard, I remind you that we need to echo the sentiments of Paul to Timothy 
1 verse 8 and I quote the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me from his heavenly for his heavenly kingdom to him be the glory forever and I can add another forever so brothers and sisters I entreat you as part of the army of God let us at the beginning of this year close ranks let us in the words of Paul in this same text verse 27 let us give no place to the devil let us according to the NIV that same 27 let him have no foothold amongst us. And even as I speak today, there's some of you in the hearing of my voice who may be faced with some giants in your life. The enemy may be taunting you and poking fun at you and your God. But I want you not to retreat, not to surrender. Not to run away and hide, but to face him. Face him like David faced him. Face him adopting David's attitude. Who refused to be docile and to be quiet. In the midst of the dauntings. Of the warrior Goliath. David who refused to return home but lingered around the camp and the battlefield because he could not stomach what he heard coming from the other side. David, brothers and sisters, he was driven by a sense of duty and he was determined by the help of God to shut the mouth of that uncircumcised Philistine, to use this precise language. You know this story quite well. He was unfamiliar with the sword and the spear, the shield. Those pieces of equipment with which trained soldiers were accustomed. But all he had was his get up work. His sling and one small stone. But my friends, he was driven, as I said, by a sense of duty and a passion to destroy the enemy of his soul and the enemy of his people and to again bring honor and glory to the name of his God. And so David was able to face that giant Goliath. And in the words of 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse 45, was able to say to him, you come against me with a spear and a sword, the NIV says a javelin, but I come against you in the name of God Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel. You see, David knew his general, God, the great captain of the hosts of Israel, who had never yet lost a battle. He knew his king of kings and lord of lords would come to his aid and come to his assistance and of course the rest is history. What are we talking about today? Paul's challenge to the true followers of Christ. He said to them, walk, walk worthily. Walk worthily. But secondly, the apostle.
apostle, apostle seem to suggest to the Ephesians and to us as well that we should walk wisely. That we should walk wisely. In fact, it is quite clear that Paul suggests to the Ephesians that there were new principles or new operatives now in their lives. Now that they found Jesus, there was now a, a new perspective for them, a new priority, oh hallelujah. I want to remind us in the body of Christ today, brothers and sisters, that newness in Christ is not just about identifying a list of New Year resolutions and trying to keep them on. It is not even about the so-called rebranding that we attempt to do. I submit to you that it has to do with regeneration. Hallelujah. That actual change which the Holy Spirit brings about in the life of an individual. It is what Jesus suggested to Nicodemus. He must be born again. And thank God today. He is still recreating. He is still making men and women brand new. In fact the word says. That any man in Christ Jesus. Is a new creature. Hallelujah. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. But relatedly and concomitantly, meaning that it happens at one and the same time, there is also what we call a positional change. There is not only an actual change being made new, but there is a positional change which occurs. We are justified, hallelujah. We are set free. We move from a place of condemnation to a place of freedom in Christ, oh hallelujah. And Paul expresses that freedom so beautifully in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. To them which are in Christ Jesus, hallelujah, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But Paul also seems secondly to suggest that there is a particular and what I call a peculiar modus operandi by which we must operate as Christians. And this modus operandi is consistent with those principles found in God's word. Hallelujah. Right there verse 2. There must be a putting off of the old self, Paul says. The old self which is corrupt. The old self which is carnal. But he goes on to say in verse 24... That there must be a putting on of the new self. A putting off and a putting on. That new self. Which is marked by righteousness. And marked by holiness. Oh hallelujah. There's an old song which we used to sing in church. The things I used to do. I do them no more. There's a great change since I've been born. Hallelujah. Even the places I used to go, I go there no more. There's a great change since I've been born. The friends I used to keep, I keep them no more. At least not at that level. Because there's a great change since I've been born. Oh, hallelujah. Put off. Put on. But thirdly and relatedly, Paul seemed to suggest that there's a measure of what I call positivity and 
activity that must govern our interactions and relationships within the body of Christ. When you get a chance, you must read verse 25 to 29 of the text. But look, look at some of the things which Paul seemed to highlight in terms of this proactive behavior and positive behavior. He said in verse 25, we must avoid what I call fraudulent behavior. Embedded in the words of the text, 25. But off falsehood. And speak truthfully with your neighbor. Any truth speakers in the house today? Oh, hallelujah. So, but off fraudulent behavior. Avoid fraudulent behavior. I don't have the time to expand on these. But it seems to just suggest, secondly, in verse 25, that we must promote the interests of the Christian family. And I, I, I came to that conclusion based on what he said in verse 25 that we are all members of one body and if we are all members of one body it means that we are committed to seeking the common good of each other. We share similar hopes. We, we share similar pains and joys and frustrations. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And if that is so, we must take note of those four things quickly that he says in verse 25. So let not the sun go down on your wrath. Look, there's always room for reconciliation and forgiveness. One song said, don't, don't let me leave behind an unfinished task. You know how many people have gone to the grave? Have we not reconciled over simple things? Unfinished tasks. And it is not a sign of weakness today, brothers, to say, I'm sorry. It's not a sign of weakness to admit I've been wrong. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. And this applies whether we are in a, a, a family relationship, husband and wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, parents, children, neighbors, colleagues. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Uh, the word says, as much as in you life. Seek to live peaceably with all men. Secondly, no more stealing. But work with your hands. And of course we have too much of that literally. In too many countries of the world. And Paul seems to suggest that as you work. You not only have the opportunity to take care of yourself and your family. But to share with those in need. In fact that's the third point he makes. Share with those who are in need. And then lastly, he says, stop talking foolishness. That's how he summarizes what he said in verse 25. Stop talking foolishness. I mean, you can excuse yourself when you're outside of Christ, not knowing Christ. It's amazing the nonsense you talk. But I hear the writer says, the writer said to us, that what we speak for should be savory. A building so that they who hear us may benefit therefrom. And I'm glad that we have, a, we have much to talk about. We have much to sing about. The Sovereign said the children of the Lord have a, a right to shout and sing. Another said, He has done so much for me. I can't tell it all. I feel like singing and shouting and praising the Lord. He has done so much for me. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, Paul's trying to 
established the true followers of Christ walk worthily. Walk wisely. But thirdly, and lastly, I hear Paul suggesting to the Ephesians and suggesting to us as well that we should walk worshipfully. We should walk worshipfully. Verse 30 and following. Worship by definition, brothers and sisters, is the act of attributing reverent honor and homage to God. The psalmist in Psalm 95, verse 6 and 7 says, Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. Across the denominational divide, there are different practices and different perspectives in relation to this issue of worship. But here's an interesting extract which I want to share with you from Troy Watson. In his article entitled, Worship as an Act of Loving God, and I quote, we all worship in different ways because we are all different. Genuine worship honors the uniqueness of individuals, but it also confronts our individualities. It both affirms who we are and transforms who we are. He further states, Our worship fails to transform us when we are just going through the motions, or when our primary focus is on what worship does for us. Does this sound familiar? Too often our worship is about including a certain intellectual or emotional state rather than deepening our actual relationship with God. There's nothing wrong with desiring good feelings and intellectual stimulation in worship. God wants us to experience joy and peace and intellectual rejuvenation. The problem is, we are prone to become addicted to these intellectual and emotional states. We turn worship into getting our fix. We do not worship because we love God. We worship because we love the feeling or intellectual invigoration or certainty that worship brings in the court. But let me remind you, brothers and sisters, and based on the definition earlier given, that worship is not just an act, but worship is a daily lifestyle. And I want to crave your indulgence because here's a very, very relevant quote from Rob Kiefer, who states, there are many scriptural references to worship. But the best known may be Romans 12, 1, and you know that very well. We are required to submit our bodies as living sacrifices unto God, that we may prove what is our spiritual worship. So he goes on to say, worship isn't something we simply feel. Worship isn't the name we give some experience that we seek while singing, lifting our hands or closing our eyes. It's something we do with our bodies in all of life. We can worship God through our eating, our drinking, our typing, our speaking, cooking, driving, 
and countless other ways. We worship God whenever we perform an act out of a desire to draw attention to His greatness, especially revealed in sending His Son as a substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. End of quote. But in addition to these definitions, and the suggestion that worship is a daily walk. As I wrap up this sermon, I want to suggest to you that there is what I call a deliberateness and intentionality associated with worship. A deliberateness and intentionality associated with worship. Verse 30. Because it was saying to us that Paul says that we should not, we should not grieve the Holy Spirit. And my friends, if we consider all the whole spectrum of life as worship, it means nothing we do. Or all that we do, we will seek to ensure that it brings honor and glory to God. So when we disobey Him, when we get involved in foolishness, bad behavior, not only do we discredit our families at times and our societies and even our country, but we can discredit, bring discredit to the name of Christ. And grieve his Holy Spirit. And notice what Paul says in verse 31. Not only what must we avoid grieving the Holy Spirit, but he seems to suggest as I jumped ahead of myself that we must get rid, we must get rid of those things which are contrary to God's will and purpose. Verse 31. Things like bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander, envy, malice, those things which are part of the carnal nature, consistent with the carnal mind. But lastly, he seemed to suggest to us that we must practice that which is good and wholesome. And that is such a beautiful law of which to end. Look. If more people will be committed to doing good, to practicing good, to being, to being caring and forgiving, to being compassionate and loving, to being Christ-like, our communities would be a better place. Our Caribbean region would be a better place. The world at large would be a better place. And my friends, this is our ultimate as we seek to serve Christ. Our ultimate is to be Christ-like, all oh, to be like me, the songwriter said. Blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art, come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, and stamp thine image deep in my heart. And so as we face this year, I, like you, don't know what's ahead, but we serve a great God who is with us. Who has promised my brothers and sisters never to leave us nor to forsake us, but to be with us always. Oh, may God help us to be steadfast, to be unmovable, and to always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor in Him will not be in vain. So as his adherents, as his followers, wherever you are today, hear in our voice. Let us accept this challenge given by Paul years ago to the Ephesians and certainly to us today. Let us walk worthily. Let us walk wisely. Let us walk worship. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, we have shared with your people today what you have laid on our hearts. Oh God, move by your spirit.
Amen. 